Okay, so we are going to be informed by these vintage postcards that I traced these elements uh, for everyone. And we want to keep them at postcard format. So we just photographed this with the, the built-in camera. And then I opened it up in Photoshop. But before I put it in Photoshop, I made a file that was large enough. And that large enough is 11 by 14 inches by 350 pixels per inch. So I'll demonstrate that again quickly, just because it's it's been a while. If we open up the, the sketch we took with the computer's camera in Photoshop, the first thing you'll notice well, the first thing you might notice is because we use FaceTime, it might need to be flipped. So you can do that in preview ahead of time like I did here, or you can you can go to image, um, not image, I'm sorry, you can transform, command T, right? So select it all, command A, command T, right click within it, and then you can flip it horizontal with a transform command. The reason you have to say uh, select command A to select all is just because it's a background. The next thing you might notice once it's flipped is that it's hard to see. The lighting's not great. So you can always go within Photoshop, just like you can in preview, to adjustments. And then you can just use auto tone to brighten the, the contrast between the lights and darks. And then the last thing you might notice, and this is very easy to see with guides, is that your image might not be the clean rectangle it is on your paper. And that's because we might be holding it at different angles, right? And so this gives us a chance to practice what we did with the last two assignments, right? To transform it, Command T, and stretch it. I'm going to use Distort first to line up the top and bottom. Guides can be very helpful. And then use Warp to straighten out this edge. It doesn't need to be perfect, but should be pretty close because this is our assigned composition. We wanna make sure it's the same format. Okay, now that we have that, you can toggle your guides on and off. Oh, I gotta change that corner there. Just distort that out. Okay, so once we have that, we can toggle our guides on and off by hitting command semicolon. And now this is my composition. If I want to be really precise about it, I can use the crop tool and crop not over the top of those lines, but right to the edge of them. Because you don't want to accidentally cut more off than you need. And then just hit return. So that is my postcard composition. The problem is, if I go to image size, it is only 72 pixels per inch, and it's only basically 5 by 7 inches, which is almost perfect in terms of its physical size, because that's what a postcard is. But that resolution is not print quality. So we are going to force this up. We are going to force it up in resolution to be 350 pixels per inch, our lab standard for printing. And we're going to force it up in physical size to around 11 by 14. So I'm going to take the smallest dimension here, which is the height, and make that 11 inches so that you have at least 11 by 14. And for the postcards, it looks like it'll be closer to 11 by 17, which is a standard size as well. Okay, what does that do to our lines? It makes them fuzzy as anything, right? Because the computer is creating a lot of pixels, but it doesn't matter. This is just a template. Now, because it's the right resolution, any reference we want to bring in we know will have to be big enough like that to actually fill that resolution at an adequate size. And that's why we check each one. So look at all those pixels. It's a grainy photo because it's a sunset and the ISO has to be high, but still it works as a high resolution image. But before we get that far, the problem with collaging in a digital file like this is you wouldn't like set up a collage with your sketch of what you want and then just only put cutouts onto your sketch. 
especially putting things onto your sketch before you cut them out, because it would just hide everything. It's kind of that problem we had with our shape composition. So we need to create a working space. So what we do is we create a canvas size around it that is 40 inches wide, 30 inches tall. So you go to image canvas size 40 by 30 and your extension color is going to be gray. And if it's not a background layer, it will just fill it in with empty space. But what you can do is create a new layer, move it behind your sketch layer and say edit fill with middle gray. So it looks like that. This now gives us an 11 by 14 by 350 pixel per inch uh, workspace and then a desk basically to set all of our different references on. So now instead of putting them right on top, we do things like this. We can just drag and drop references we found, which in some cases are huge, and we know they never need to be larger than our actual project. And some will be slightly smaller, right? And we don't want to uh, enlarge them. We can shrink, but not enlarge. And we just kind of place them around our composition. And you can push them off to the side and then hit return. We're placing these smart objects. Um, because for the most part, Actually, I'm going to put them under my composition. That's going to work well. For the most part, we know what they are, right? Now, how do you find good reference? Where am I getting all this stuff? You're doing it from an internet search. And when you do Google image searches, remember, you want to use tools and say larger than 8 megapixels. So one thing I wanted to look up are twin suns, right? And anything that's actually a, a Hubble space telescope image or a NASA image or something taken from the space station. All of these are actually public domain images. Like this one's beautiful. So how do I make sure it's large? Well, you click on it. It looks large. It says it's large, but I have to say open image in new tab by right clicking on it to actually see it at full resolution and then zoom in. Again, it should take up almost four of your screens and you can see this is high quality resolution I can use this and then you can save it to your desktop or this one which I liked I'm going to open that image in a new tab it gives me this I zoom in pretty nice so not like Star Wars fan art but an actual image of twin suns can be very useful. Now, you can get a lot of uh, glitches. Let me see if I can find one. So let's say I really like this. I have to check each one. I look at it full size. Yeah. It's pretty good, but it's not four times the size, right? So you want to you wanna always check that resolution. I think eight megapixels will be enough, but then sometimes it's just clearly mis, mistagged. And you'll run into that for sure. It's hard to know which ones are mistagged without checking each one. But let's say I wanted this. Okay, this is a nice example. That says it's 5,000 by 2,800 pixels, but its image is smaller than it should be in the preview. So if I say open image in new tab, it gives me this, <laughs> right? It doesn't get any bigger. That's a broken link, right? That's just the thumbnail for a large image that used to exist, but no longer exists online. So you don't want to save those. And then you don't want to make the mistake that some people can do early on in this class and actually save the thumbnail, right? The thumbnail is always tiny. You need to find the actual image. So if you, if you save the thumbnail, you'll be able to recognize it sometimes by its name. So notice all of these have names <laughs> that are unique to the file. This just says download 
or I might just say something like images, but it's some generic name because that's just a thumbnail. And if I open it up in preview, it's tiny. And if I zoom in, I just see the pixels. Right. Okay, so that's good quality reference. You only want good quality reference, only eight megapixels or larger. Some of it's gonna be a lot larger, that's okay. How do you organize it? Well, if you notice, I've already given you numbers. I've numbered the far background as number one. In most cases, I've numbered the background, which is a little bit nearer to the viewer, as number two. The middle ground is number three. Sometimes you'll have a, two middle grounds, right? Like a near and a far middle ground. And then I have uh, the foreground here is number four, and the near foreground is number five. So that's at least five different elements. So what do I do? Well, for, for number one, that's the first thing you're going to composite in. That's usually the sky or this, the far horizon. It's the easiest thing to composite because you don't have to cut anything out. You're just layering it up. So I've created a folder that is called far background textures for the sky. And I, I encourage you to be creative here. So I have sky, but I also have these kind of paint st spill textures I found because I want it to be fantasy. And they're pretty fascinating. And these kind of organic things can be warped. And used and layered up to make a really cool exotic fantasy sky. Um, I think I liked this one a lot. Now, how many do I need? I don't need more than one. <laughs> but I'll show you how fun it is to to take control creatively here. So if I'm going to composite it, first I'm gonna bring a lot of this reference in. When I bring it in, it comes in as a smart object, which means you can't edit it, right? But you have to place it. So before you place it, don't grow them. Because when you grow them, that's gonna require the computer to make up pixels to show it at the size. It comes in at its native resolution. You can shrink them if you know they're bigger than you need. But growing them requires the computer to make up pixels. Because they're smart objects, shrinking them doesn't actually lose any memory. It's only when we rasterize the smart layer that we set the actual pixels within Photoshop. So I'm going to move my sketch down below everything. Well, no, I'll move it up above. Turn off my guides and then decide, okay, I'm just wanting to fill in this part and this part with sky. This is my smallest reference. I don't want to use it. So I'm just going to delete that right away. This one is nice, easy fill. So I'm going to move that up above my sky. Now, how can I place this in? I can play with the opacity and see, okay, which parts actually overlap, just that and that. So maybe I want more of these brighter colors in the sky. But I like these, these kind of clouds. So I'm going to put it there. And then I'm going to put it at 100%. Right. And then I could be done. I have my guides that show me I'm only using this part of the image. Because it's the far background, I don't need anything more than that. I don't need to cut it out because things are going to be cut out on top of it, right? So you want a lot of overlap as you're compositing. But because it is fantasy, I could take this layer, move it up above, and I can try layering this on top of that sky. Right? I could even try a different blending mode like soft light or pin light are some of my favorites. Or overlay. And now I have kind of this swirling strangeness in the sky. And I can play with a combination of opacity and blending mode to get something that's pretty unique, even if it's only for the far background. So let's say I like that. That's good. That's far background. I'm going to make the far background the lowest color for the layers just to help understand. That's going to be gray. If I wanted to, I could select both those layers, click on the folder to put them into a group folder of my layers, and call that the far background. So far, so good. All these others, 